All right, this is Austin Baxley teaching a lecture for History 1302 at Como Picton and NTCC. So, hey guys, how are y'all doing? Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Great Depression, the next chapter in our textbook after the Roaring Twenties. So we're going to try to hit the high points. There's a lot going on in the Great Depression and there's a lot we have to cover. So let's get started. Before we go any further though, take some notice from the Great Depression, okay? Great Depression is its own biggest advocate and you need to be your own advocate. Whatever you do, do it and be the best. The Great Depression wasn't content being an okay depression. It was the greatest depression ever. Anyways, that's just a little joke for y'all. It's kind of weird because there's nobody here to laugh at my jokes and, or at least pretend to laugh at my jokes so that people think that, you know, hey, Maybe he'll like us if we laugh at his jokes, but don't worry, you can pretend to laugh behind the screen as well. It's all right. So anyways, let's get started. So when we talk about the Great Depression, we have to think about it in the context of the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties for the United States was a really, really good period of time for our economy. Our economy grew dramatically, it drew very quickly, but as we entered the end of the Roaring Twenties, the United States started to be kind of a lone wolf as far as having a good economy. The rest of the world, especially Europe, after World War I, went through an economic depression. The United States was spared at first, but over time, economic problems in Europe started to spread over to the United States. And there are some problems going on underneath the United States economy. The first one is overexpansion. To put it simply, Companies were waking, making way too much stuff, okay? There was a lot of demand. There's a lot of growth, and like we talked about with the uh, Roaring Twenties lecture. The United States got better at producing things more efficiently, so we start making more and more stuff, and there gets to be too much stuff, and there's a surplus. And when there's a surplus of goods and there's not enough demand, the price of those goods start, starts to drop dramatically, okay? Afterwards, we have growing disparity between top earners and wage workers. There's a lot of growth in the economy, but most of that growth in the Roaring Twenties goes to the very top earners, and average wage workers don't see as much of that growth. In the Roaring Twenties, a lot of Americans thought things were going well. They thought, hey, I've got a job. I'm making money. Let's buy something on credit. And people started buying large items and going into debt to purchase those large items, thinking that they're gonna have a job in the future. When you go into debt, you believe that you'll have money in the future to pay for something that you want today. And in the Roaring Twenties, people were very confident in the economy, and that turned out to be a mistake because lots of people started going into debt, and that created some instability in the economy. The next thing was that the Federal Reserve System, that's our bank of banks, the regulatory system that regulates our banks, it was established during the Progressive Era, it allowed banks to operate without any guarantees to their customers, which meant that if a bank did ever fail, there was no guarantee that people would get their money back. Then we have speculation. There are people that were buying risky stocks in the stock market. And we've talked about the stock market before, how it's a way that you can purchase a share of ownership of a company. And speculation is when people buy those risky stocks thinking that they're going to win big. The stock market's kind of like the lottery. Okay. And if you, you know, buy something cheap and then it turns out to be a great company, you can make a lot of money, but you can also lose a lot as well. And one thing that happened that was very, very messy was this word right here, buying on the margins. Buying on the margins is the idea of taking out a loan to buy a stock. So the way it works, let's imagine that you want to buy a stock and it costs $1,000, but you don't have $1,000. So you get a loan for $1,000 and you buy the stock. A couple years later, if the economy is going well, perhaps that company that you bought a stock in, let's say you bought a stock in an oil company, that oil company stock is now worth two years later, $1,100. Well, then you can sell the stock, pay off your $1,000 debt, and then walk away with $100. And so if you buy on the margins and the stock does well, you can make a lot of money. But the stock market is not guaranteed. It's very easy for stocks to lose value. And so if you take out a thousand dollar loan, you buy a thousand dollar stock, but then that company fails and now the stock is worth $600,
you try to sell the stock, you only get $600 back and now you're $400 in debt and you have nothing to show for it. So speculation and buying on the margins was very popular in the roaring 20s because people thought they could get rich really quick. And that was leading to some instability that would ultimately lead to a crash. At the same time, as we've talked about over and over, overproduction in agriculture was leading to prices decreasing all across the country, and farmers were struggling during the Roaring Twenties, while a lot of people were thriving. Farmers were having a hard time. It all kind of comes to a head in 1929. Okay, with the stock market. So remember the stock market is where people buy and sell ownership of companies. And a lot of people thought it was the easy way to become a millionaire. Okay, 1925 to 1929 saw the largest growth in the value of stocks. In 1925, the total value of stocks at New York was 27 billion. By 1929, it was 87 billion. That means that if you had say $100 in the stock market in 1925, it was now worth $300 in just four years. So it's a very fast way to make money. And so people all across the country were throwing everything they could in the stock market. They said, you can't lose. You got, you can put a hundred thousand dollars in it. And then, you know, in a few years, you'll have $300,000 in it. And then in a few more years, you'll be a millionaire. And so people all across the country are throwing everything they have. They're throwing their savings in the stock market. Then they're getting loans and putting that in the stock market. And this is very dangerous. And the stock market, it really depends on people's belief in the value of stocks, okay? Remember, the companies that you're buying stocks from, they're not in the New York Stock Exchange. They're not physically there. They might be a factory in Pennsylvania in a farm in Florida that have you know stocks that are being sold and bought in New York. And so the New York Stock Exchange, this big building, this room where there's lots of people running around buying and selling stuff, it's loud, it's chaotic. And if people start selling, other people notice, say, hey, why'd you sell that stock? You think it's not gonna make any more money? Is this stock a bad stock? We gotta go sell our stock. Guys, we gotta sell our stock. Sell, 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 sell. And it will spread like kind of like a, just, just a wave of panic that'll spread throughout a stock market if something bad happens. And so that panic happened on October 24th, 1929. Companies across the country were starting to lose money because of overproduction and all those things we talked about on the last slide. And on October 24th, 1929, people realized, hey, the economy is not growing like it was back in the roaring 20s. It's starting to get out, go down. And when that happens, people try to get out, okay? If you've got a million dollars in stock and the price of that stock is decreasing, the longer you hold on to that money, the less money you're gonna have. And so if you wait two or three days, your million dollars might only be 800,000. Then a few more days, it might be only 500,000. So you gotta get out if you wanna save any of your money left. But when you do that, other people start to sell too. And then more and more and more people start to sell. The price of stock starts just decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And by Tuesday, October 29th, over 16 million shares of company were sold at a loss. And many stocks couldn't be sold at all. Like people were trying to sell, but no one would buy them. Now, when this was happening, there were some super mega rich people like those old robber barons of the Gilded Age, some of them are still hanging around like JP Morgan. And JP Morgan decided he was gonna try to buy all these worthless stocks to try to reverse the trend, but it doesn't work. Now, he ends up making a pretty penny later on because after the Great Depression ends, he's got all this stock and when stocks go back up, he's made a lot of money, but it doesn't stop the crash from happening. So you can see here on this graph, you can see how the price of stocks was just going up and up and up and up and up through the 1920s. And then in 1929, 1930, it just tanks and crashes incredibly. Here's another one. This, this map really kind of shows you that first day, that October 29th. Now, what happens from this is there's some ripple effects in the economy. Now, you need to know that only about 10% of Americans actually had stock in the stock market. 90% of Americans owned zero stocks. But the stock market affects everybody else because the stock market reflects the amount of money that businesses have in their investment. It reflects the value of those investments. Okay, stocks fell from $87 billion worth to $15 billion by 1932. So in three years, the number of stocks all across the country fell. And what this really hurts is banks, okay? There are many banks that have decided 
that it's easier to make money by putting money in the stock market than it was to just loan it out. Traditionally, the way a bank works is that they take savings deposits and checking deposits from customers, and then they use those deposits to loan out money to people getting mortgages and other types of loans, and then they use the interest from those loans to make money and they pay a little bit of money to the savings accounts so that they can use the money. When you put your money in the bank, it's not like there's a big vault in the back where all your money is stashed. That money is used. They take your money and they loan it to someone else. And the idea is that most of the time, there's enough money that the bank holds in reserve, so if you need to go to the bank and take all your money out, they'll probably be okay. But when lots of people do that, that's a problem. And so many banks were starting to lose money. They're losing money because people had borrowed money to buy stocks and then they couldn't pay back their loans. They're losing money because they might have bought stocks themselves and now their stocks are becoming worthless. And so people across the country realize that the banks are failing and so they run to the bank. Literally, they call them bank runs. People are rushing to get to banks and withdraw their money from the bank before the banks completely fail. And when this happens is banks can't operate. When all of a sudden everybody starts taking their money out of the banks, guess what? The banks don't have any more money. They run out of money and the banks fall apart. And when banks fail, that leads to businesses fail because businesses rely on banks to operate, to buy and sell things, to borrow money, to save money. And when businesses fail, they have to fire their workers. And you see unemployment rising from 1.5 million in 1929 to 12 million in 1932. That was 25% of the working population. That meant that out of all the people that wanted a job in America, one fourth of them could not get a job, okay? And when people lose their jobs, they can't go out and buy stuff at stores, which means that those stores start losing money and then they have to start firing people. And it's a big cycle that just kept going and going and it made things more and more worse. And to top it all off, in the Midwest, there's a massive drought that dries up the whole country and it leads to something called the Dust Bowl. So it gets worse. The Dust Bowl. It was caused by severe drought and poor farming techniques. People, farmers out in the Great Plains had been plowing up that soil and plowing and plowing and plowing up and exposing large amounts of dirt to the air. Like we talked about dirt is important. The Great Plains used to have real thick grass back whenever, you know, the Indians uh, roamed and the buffaloes roamed and they had that nomadic lifestyle. Those grasses never got really plowed up and so they had really thick layers of sod. So thick we talked about with the sod busters, there were even some that built their houses out of that sod from that grass. Well, by the 1930s, okay, farmers have plowed up a large amount of that soil thanks to the homestead act you have thousands and thousands of farmers living out in the great plains and when it stops raining that dirt dries up and there's nothing to hold the dirt on the ground because the roots are gone from the grass and whenever it's really really dry your crops aren't growing so that dirt is just turns to dust and wind starts picking it up and carrying it across the country. And this leads to massive storms, walls, hundreds or thousands of feet tall of dirt that would just swarm across the country, okay? You can, I recommend you try to search just videos of the Dust Bowl, there's footage of it. It's massive, it's scary. People would hide in their homes and cover their mouths with rags and try to keep the dirt out, but they couldn't. You know, animals that got caught out in a dust storm might die. People could get lost. It was deadly, it was dangerous, and it led to thousands of people running away, okay? From 1934 to 1940, the Dust Bowl ravaged the Great Plains, and the earliest years were the worst, and the worst areas are kind of shown here on this chart. And it forces tens of thousands of people to abandon their homes and try to move to California. There's a book, The Grapes of Wrath, which talks about a family that tried to escape the Dust Bowl by going to California to grow grapes. But then they get to California and there's no jobs there and it's not as good anyways. But that's where the phrase Okies comes from. Those Oklahoma people or others that moved out and went to California during the Dust Bowl. Now, 
When this happens, President Herbert Hoover is in charge and many people have lost their jobs, they've lost their homes, they've lost their ability to meet basic needs. There are shanty towns that appear all across the country. Charity organizations are overwhelmed by the needs of so many people. And there's increasing number of people protesting what they saw was an inactive government. They thought the government did not care about them. In 1924, Many Congress, uh, the United States Congress had given out some bonus certificates to World War I veterans. They said, thank you for your service in World War I. We'll pay you in 1945 $1,000. And so that happened back during the good times during the Roaring Twenties. Well, by 1932, there's a lot of World War I veterans that have lost their job. They don't have anything left, but they got this piece of paper that says, hey, this is good for $1,000 in 1945. Well, that's 13 years from now. So many veterans wanted their bonuses early. So 15,000 World War I veterans marched to Washington, D.C. in June 1932 to talk to President Hoover and Congress, and the president refused to meet with them. The Congress debated whether or not to help them, and while they were waiting around, the soldiers just built a shanty town. They just set up shacks and, you know, cardboard boxes or whatever and just camped in Washington, D.C., and they remained there even after Congress rejected their demands. So on July 28th, 1932, the protesters were removed by the police and the military led by General Douglas MacArthur. And this was crazy. These are World War I veterans that got driven out of Washington, D.C. by the U.S. military. People all across the country were upset at how the veterans had been treated, and there was no help given to them at all in this time of their need. And that's kind of indicative of what happened with Herbert Hoover. Hoover wasn't really responsible for the Great Depression, but a lot of people associated the problems with him, okay? You know, if people lost their homes and they started being homeless and living in cardboard boxes, they would call those little shanty towns Hoovervilles, okay? If you had to go to sleep and you only had was a, a newspaper for a blanket, that was called a Hoover blanket. If your pockets were empty and they were sticking out, that was called a Hoover flag. You got your white pocket uh, hanging out of your uh, pocket and that's saying I don't have any money because uh, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover said that what America needed was rugged individualism. He didn't believe that it was the government's responsibility to take care of the individual person. He felt that individuals needed to work hard and to do what's right and to, you know, if you do what's right and you, you work hard and you, you make sure you make good decisions, then you'll be all right, okay? Just, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, okay, buddy? And uh, that wasn't really enough for many people in America. Herbert Hoover also wanted to try to balance the budget. He wanted America to be fiscally responsible and not be in debt. And so in 1930, he signed the Holly Smoot Tariff, which created less government spending and more taxes, which is not what you want to do when people are struggling. At that point, you want to give people a break, but adding more taxes while you're already out of a job made a lot of people really upset. Herbert Hoover did do a few things to try to help people. Mainly, he tried to help city governments and local governments by doing things like public works projects through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which would give out public loans for what projects like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, where people could get a job and build the bridge and that would give them help. But Herbert Hoover didn't want to give money to individual people. So in 1932, we have an election and FDR runs for president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He runs against Herbert Hoover for the Democratic Party and he promises to do something about the Great Depression. He promises a new deal for the American people and a repeal of prohibition. And Roosevelt wins by a landslide. People are tired of the Great Depression. They're ready to do anything to make their life better. And so Roosevelt wins 58% of the popular vote and 89% of the electoral vote. Some of the social consequences of the Great Depression, you see a lot more mass migration. People try to move across the country to find better opportunities. And you see a lot of people moving out of the city to the country or moving from the country to the city. You see a lot of hitchhikers, a lot of homeless people, you know, riding trains and 
and, and uh, just wandering around because they don't have a job, they don't have any opportunities, so they're just trying to look for the next best place to be. You start to see increased rates of crime, people are getting desperate, you see increased rates of suicide, people aren't eating as much, so there's malnutrition, which leads to health problems. You see growth in prostitution, alcoholism, there's just generally poor health care in the United States during the Great Depression. You see less and less people going to college, but you see people going to high school more because high school is free and many young people don't have a job anyways, so they might as well stay in high school. People start putting off getting married, but at the same time, people don't get divorced as much. You know, again, this is when times are uncertain and things are scary. People either tend to stick together or they put things off. You know, let's not get married until we get a job, that sort of thing. But there is an increased rate of abandonment. Some people don't want to worry about the paperwork. They just they lose their job, they just up and leave. And so there's a lot of people that just abandon their families. You see birth rates across the country fall. People put off having a kid because they don't know when their next meal is going to come from. They can't plan for a kid. And when people tried to have fun during the Great Depression, they really focused on escaping their problems. So you see popular culture move towards escapism. Even though people don't have as much money, people still go to the movies and they still go and watch sports and they go see the football games and baseball games because people are willing to pay what little money they have on a chance to escape. Okay. To forget about your problems. You go to the movie, you, you, you sit down, you get your popcorn, you get your soda and then Frankenstein's monster is running around, you know, doing his Frankenstein monster thing, or you watch gone with the wind, this four hour movie all about, way back in the, the days when it was the Civil War and Reconstruction, and you could go and watch those movies and forget about your problems. King Kong comes out during the Great Depression. You know, if you're watching a movie about this giant ape fighting T-Rexes, you're not worried about the fact that you don't have a job. So people were willing to pay money just to escape. And during the Great Depression, radio was still flourishing. A lot of people bought radios back in the 1920s when times were good. And guess what? They still work in the 1930s and it's free. All you got to have is a little bit of electricity. So many people continue to listen to the radio and radio continues to flourish during the Great Depression. And many people listen to a new and popular form of music called the blues. All right, so we're going to just jump right into the New Deal. Okay, so. I'm going to have it all in one video if we can. So now let's talk about the New Deal. So when Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins the presidential election in 1932, he becomes president in 1933. FDR is one of the most important presidents in American history. He's kind of controversial to some, but if you want to point out the president of the 20th century, 1900 to 2000, which president was the most important? It's FDR. It's FDR by a landslide. Nobody else compares to the historical importance of FDR. And I'll explain why, okay? FDR campaigned in 1932 as a force for change, and he promised to help people in the United States. As a leader, FDR was willing to experiment in bold ways to do whatever he thought was necessary to help the people of the United States, even if those methods were not tested or guaranteed to be actually helpful. He just wanted to do something. Sometimes they would try things they had no idea if it would work, but they just did something rather than sit around. And so for many people who were desperate, they were totally willing to give this president a chance. They said, you know what? This may not work, but let's just try it, okay? This is better than do nothing Herbert Hoover, okay? Uh, FDR was really good at communicating and he used the radio to directly connect with the American people through something called fireside chats, okay? He would come on the radio typically in the evening when people were listening to the radio after they'd got home from work or they hadn't been working, just hanging out. And um, they would, he would explain in clear, common language what was going on with his administration. He was really good at taking complicated economic and political problems, and distilling them into language that the average American could understand. And because of that, Franklin Delano Roosevelt really gained the love and affection of Americans all across the country. Now, 
When FDR takes over, the first thing he, ta he tackles is the problem of banks. By 1932, in three years, nearly 5,800 banks across America had gone out of business, okay? And this was bad because people who had money in those banks, they lost it. Let's say you had not done anything wrong. Let's say you were a good employee. You had never, you know, gotten anything in the stock market. You had always paid your bills and you saved your money. You weren't in debt. You had put, you know, four or $5,000 in your savings account. You had been a good, hardworking American, but then your bank closes and all that money is gone. You didn't do anything wrong. But the great, in the Great Depression, there are a lot of people that just got messed over. They didn't do anything wrong. They weren't the people that were overproducing. They weren't the people going into debt. They weren't the people that were doing bad stuff in the stock market, but they still lost all their money. And so we have to fix it. So two days after being inaugurated, Roosevelt declares a national bank holiday. From March 6th to March 10th, all the banks in America are closed. Nobody goes to the banks. Nobody gets their money out. We're going to pause it. We're going to hit a timeout and we're going to figure out this situation. In those five days, he gets Congress together and he says, we're going to fix this right now. So they pass a law within those five days called the Emergency Banking Act. What the Emergency Banking Act did was it gave the president the power to open banks. On, a bank could only open back up for business if the president approved it. That meant that they would be solvent. And he, it also gave the president the authority to help banks that were in trouble, give them some assistance to help them get their finances in order. So after the bank holiday was over, some banks were allowed to reopen completely. Some banks were open only to accept savings deposits or checking deposits. And some banks were forced to stay closed until they could fix their finances. So what this did was it told Americans that if a bank is open, that means it's safe. If FDR thinks it's okay, it's going to be open. So if a bank is open, you can trust it. So what this did was it restored people's faith in banks. Now, the crazy thing was, this was totally new. No one had ever done this. Can you find in the Constitution any words that say the president can have the authority to say if a bank can close or open? You probably can't. But this was a problem that the founding fathers never could have imagined, probably. Well, maybe someone imagined it, but I don't think they would have. Okay, so there was no language in the Constitution about this. But in this desperate time, we tried new things. And that's a pattern that happens through the New Deal. We do all these new things that we've never done before in order to solve this problem. Many people say that this is capitalism saved in eight days. FDR gets on the radio. He tells people that banks are safe again. And they start going back to the banks. And the banking crisis gets solved. Later on, there's a permanent solution that comes from the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act. It creates something called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and it bans banks from speculating in stocks. So this stops banks from going and wasting a lot of money in the stock market, but the FDIC, it insures bank deposits. If you go to a bank today, you'll see a sign on it that says FDIC. If you don't see a sign that says FDIC, don't put your money there because it's probably not a real bank. Okay, I don't know what it is, but they're probably scamming you. Because what the FDIC does is that if the bank fails, you will get a check for the money that you lost, okay? So let's say you have $5,000 in City National Bank in Sulphur Springs, and tomorrow a meteor falls from the sky, smashes the whole bank, it's all gone, it's all closed, all the money is, is destroyed. The FDIC will write you a check for the money that you had in that banking account, and they'll give it to you. So this restores people's faith in the banks, and it stops people from having bank runs, which were destroying our financial system. The next thing FDR tried to do was tackle unemployment. You have 25% of America's out of work. FDR says, we need to just throw some money into the system and give people some jobs. If we give people some jobs, then they'll start going and buying stuff again. If people have a job, then they'll go to the store and buy a toaster or buy groceries or buy movie tickets. And that will mean that those stores will be able to hire workers and then they'll be able to have money to spend at other stores. And maybe we can get the economy rolling again if we just 
throw a little money in the system, like you prime the pump on an engine, okay, or prime a water pump. You got to put a little gas in the in the lawnmower first before it'll get started. That's the idea. So he has a lot of laws. We're going to go through these kind of quick just to get through them. But the Federal Emergency Relief Act, FERA, gave a lot of money to state and local governments to keep state and local employees, like, you know, the janitor at the, at the uh, city hall or the police officers, you know, firefighters, that sort of thing, help them stay in jobs. Then he starts something called the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. What that did was it gave jobs to young unemployed men and they would travel across the country doing public works projects. So public work is something that everyone benefits from, like a road or a park or doing like, um, you know, cleaning out a river or a lake or something like that. The CCC built lots and lots of national parks. They did a lot of work fighting erosion and trying to fix some of the problems that created the uh, like the dust bowl, you know, they might plant a forest and that forest where acts as a windbreak to stop the wind from picking up dirt. Okay. The CCC did a lot of that and there were other organizations that did that stuff too, but we're not going to get into that. Okay. So this, the specifics is really complicated, but whether or not they planted trees to stop the dust bowl, they did a lot of work to combat uh, erosion. They did a lot of work to conserve the environment and they did a lot of work just to give people jobs. Okay. But it was kind of like a camp. And so if you were in the CCC, you lived in barracks, they fed you, you worked on a schedule and you got a check and you might send it back home or hold on to it when you got out of the CCC. Okay. But they kind of, it was almost like the army, but instead of fighting, you were working. But the Civil Works Administration, that employed 4 million Americans doing civil service work. And it didn't matter if they lived in the camp or not. And that lasted for a while, but it was temporary. Okay, a lot of these programs were temporary. They're only for a year or for two years because they were emergency measures. And so people said, we'll just do this for a little while, then the economy will get back and we'll stop it. Well, the economy wasn't getting fixed. So they had to re-up it. They had to re-renew it. And the Works Progress Administration was what renewed the CWA. The WPA was the largest relief program. It employed 9 million Americans, okay? Nine million people got jobs doing public works and artistic projects. There were even historians that got money from, from the WPA. And all this was done to help people get back to work, okay? Get people some money, get them doing stuff, okay? In Southeast United States, around the Tennessee River Valley, uh, there was something called the TVA. The Tennessee Valley Authority built hydroelectric dams across the Southeast United States, one of the poorest parts of America, the backwoods part where there's no electricity, no technology. They start damming up rivers and bringing electricity to those places and giving people jobs working on them. And then now that there's electricity there, then other companies can move in and jobs can be started there. Okay, so you can look all those up and get more detail about them as you're studying for your test and working on your test, but that's a little bit of information for them. Now, let's talk about the most controversial of the, uh, of the New Deal, and that's the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. So there's a big problem for farmers getting into debt and not being able to pay off their debt and then falling agricultural prices. So everybody's producing too much food. And when the price of food goes down, the only way to make more money is to grow more food. So it creates this big building and building problem for farmers. So what the FDR did was create something called the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, which paid farmers not to farm. It's called a subsidy. It created artificial scarcity, reducing the amount of food in America by paying people to not grow food. Now, this law was passed in the middle of the year and not in the winter. Had it been passed in the winter, it might have gone over better. But because it was passed in the middle of the year, there were a lot of farmers who had already planted their crops or they had already bred their pigs or their other animals and things like that. And so what the Agricultural Adjustment Administration literally did was they went throughout the country and they started plowing up corn. Like this farmer planted too much corn, they said, okay, we're gonna buy this corn from you, here's your check. All right, destroy the corn. Okay, and they would just plow up corn or burn it, or they would do the same for pigs. Okay, so let's say some pig farmer had a thousand pigs, but the Agricultural Adjustment Administration said he only had an allotment for, say, 500 pigs. Well, they would give him a check or whatever for his 500 pigs, and then they just shoot all the pigs, 
and then they just let them rot, okay? Because the point was not to use that food, but to have less food. They said there's too much food, so we gotta waste food. And this made a lot of people angry, okay? People thought that this was wrong. There are people across the country that are starving and the government is running around shooting pigs, okay? But it did increase farm income as many staple crop prices did double over the course of three years. But the Supreme Court found this unconstitutional in 1936. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the government can go around and shoot people's pigs, okay? And the Supreme Court was a lot more conservative than FDR, and they disagreed with the way the FDR was changing the role of government in Americans' lives, okay? The AAA was repackaged as the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act, which now there's versions of it that are still around today. That program is still in place. It's changed its names a few times, but essentially if you're a farmer of a certain type of crop, there's a limit on how much you can produce and the government kind of gives allotments to different groups of people. And there's a lot we could talk about. I could talk about allotments all day, but we're not going to, I'm gonna spare you that. But what that does is it limits the amount of food that is produced in the country. And basically, if you're a farmer, you have to get that allotment permission before you can produce certain types of things. And today, what that program does is any extra food goes to food stamps and SNAP and stuff like that, feeding the less fortunate. But at the time, back in the Great Depression and the New Deal, they were just wasting food, and that made a lot of people mad. The system's a lot better today because farmers are told to plant a certain amount of food, and then whatever extra they have that's over their allotment, that goes to food stamps, and the government buys it. And So it's a much better system now. The Farm Credit Act of 1933 helped a lot of farmers refinance their mortgages that they had lost because of the Great Depression, and the Fraser Lemke Farm Bankruptcy Act helped farmers get back their farms that they had lost due to bankruptcy, and so there's a lot of help for farmers during the New Deal. The most largest program from the New Deal was Social Security. This is the single largest expansion of the government ever. The government grew by such an enormous amount during the Social Security Act. Okay, so if you're talking about the theme of the growth of the federal government's power in your test, Social Security is a great example. Okay, this is something that never had been done before, but every single person in America got a number, Social Security number, and every single person in America got a retirement account. If you're working in America and you're in the Social Security system, you have a retirement account that is managed by the federal government. This is the single largest step in the government becoming directly involved in the welfare of individual people. Before the Social Security Act, the government cared about people in theory, you know, like the government didn't want people to die. You know, we had an army to protect people. We had police, that sort of thing, firefighters. But now the government cares about your individual welfare. Every single person in America that has a Social Security number is managed by the U.S. government. And they know how much money you make and how much money you put into the Social Security system. And when you get old and retire, that ends up helping you have income when you're elderly. So this is designed to take care of the least fortunate people in America, the people that need the help the most. Okay, So current workers pay into Social Security and retirees withdraw. Social Security is not like a piggy bank. It's not like your money goes and then when you're old, you take it back out. Right now, if you've got a job that pays in Social Security, you're paying for people's grandparents and great-grandparents' retirement income. So the people that are paying in today, that money is going to the people that are withdrawing today. So young people are paying to take care of old people. And the idea is that in the future, when you're old, then the young people will take care of you. And how much money you get out of Social Security depends on how much you put in before you turn 65. This sets up a program that is really hard to remove. Once you do something like this, it's never going to go away in my opinion. Because when people start paying into Social Security, they have the expectation that they're going to get it out. Okay, And this provides a safety net for Americans in distress. It creates unemployment insurance. It creates aid for the disabled and funds for unmarried women with dependent children. So this helps people out that need help. Okay? And it helps people that are old get out of the labor market so that young people can take those jobs. 
So let's talk about the New Deal some more. We're getting close to being done. There's a lot of programs from the New Deal. We're not going to talk about all of them. You can look these up in your textbook. But there's so many of them, and they all have acronyms that it starts to become called like alphabet soup. Okay, there's hundreds of new programs, hundreds of regulations, hundreds of agencies. FDR is a progressive. Okay, when he was a young man, that was like the progressive era. Now he's in charge. Okay, and this is going to be the most ambitious government expansion of all time. The government dramatically grows during the New Deal. You have the National Industrial Recovery Act, or the NRA, works to grow businesses and improve labor conditions. It creates a managed economy. It sets up quotas for how much different factories can produce. This is trying to stop the problem of overproduction, but a lot of people don't like this. They say, this feels like socialism. The government is telling individual factories how much product they can produce. It's setting up laws regarding labor conditions that all companies have to follow. It's managing the economy, and many people felt like this was restricting freedom, okay? And so there is this, there is this trade-off. Do you want security and support from the government or do you want freedom to do what you want? If you have more and more government regulations, the amount of freedom that you have is going to decrease. If you have more freedom, then there's not going to be as much government help for people that are unfortunate. So there's a balancing act in American politics. Conservatives tend to like to have more freedom while more progressives or liberal want to have more government support. Okay, and so this trade-off creates a crisis. And after the first few years of the New Deal, a lot of people start to be suspicious of, of FDR. At the beginning, when things were crazy and bad, they're like, yes, FDR, save us. But now it's been a few years, all these new programs have helped people out, but the Great Depression is still going on. The Great Depression lasts until World War II in 1941. It doesn't go away because of the New Deal. The New Deal helps it be a little easier for people, but it doesn't get rid of it. So a lot of people are suspicious. The NRA tries to have like a propaganda campaign to promote it. The NRA outlawed child labor completely. It set maximum working hours. It set up minimum wage. It guaranteed labor unions right to collectively bargain. But many people thought it went too far and it hurt people with higher prices and businesses all across the country would break the rules or try to get around them. It was really hard to enforce. And the Supreme Court found it unconstitutional in 1936, just like they did with the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. A few more things, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, that was a watchdog for the stock market. So basically that was a, they're like police for the stock market and they try to stop people from speculating and doing things like lying on stock market reports using insider trading. And it was trying to prevent another stock market crash. Don't worry about FHA and NYA, okay? A lot of people thought the New Deal was bad. Some people thought it didn't go far enough. Some people thought it went way too far. So some people thought that capitalism was awful. We just need to go communism, okay? And there were many people in the United States that were socialists that said that the government needs to just go all the way and get rid of capitalism. An example of this is Charles Coughlin. He was a radio priest. He was a Catholic priest who would do like sermons and masses on the radio. And he was angry at FDR for not nationalizing the bank system. He wanted more government involvement in the economy. And there's people like him, like Huey Long in uh, Louisiana. There's different government officials across the country that do more government involvement in the economy than FDR did. But now, Charles Coughlin, over time, he became really anti-Semitic. He became very anti-Jewish, and he really blamed the Jews for the Great Depression. And he was kind of friendly with a certain German person and... Uh, in the 1930s named Adolf Hitler. And he was kind of our own American Nazi. We had a weird American the Nazi fascist party growing in America during the Great Depression. And the reason why I know this is because there was 40 million people that would listen to this guy on the radio. So it wasn't like he was just a crazy guy off in some corner. He was a popular figure that was advocating for national socialism or fascism in the United States. Because people were desperate and they said, we need something to fix the problem. And so this was some, a scary place that we might have went to had it not been for FDR kind of charting a more middle course. FDR really did thread the needle. Okay, He didn't go off into crazy communist land, 
but he didn't just do nothing. So he tried to do more government involvement in the economy. He tried to save capitalism while still helping people. Now, there were a lot of conservatives in America who thought, you know what, this is just bad. This new deal is awful. We need to get rid of it. And a lot of them were on the Supreme Court. Supreme Court justices are appointed by presidents for life. So if you're the president today, the Supreme Court that you're dealing with are like the people that were put under power by the presidents in the past two or three decades. So FDR is a Democrat, but the three presidents before FDR, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, were all Republicans. And so they had appointed a lot of conservative justices to the Supreme Court, and they were just left and right knocking down uh, New Deal laws as unconstitutional. This one's nullified. This one's nullified. No. Okay, AAA, you're out of here. NRA, you're out of here. And FDR got really frustrated, okay? They had a very strict interpretation of the Constitution that the government could only do what the Constitution said. And FDR was kind of loosey-goosey. He said, let's be elastic. Let's, you know, I can probably do this. It doesn't say the Constitution that I can't do it, so I can, right? And so FDR tried to, to deal with this by adding more justices to the Supreme Court. Technically, our Constitution does not say that we have to have nine justices on the Supreme Court. Really, you could get away with one. We're only supposed to, we have to have one justice on the Supreme Court. And over time, we've added justices and we're at nine. And it's been at nine for a long time. But there's nothing that says that we can't have more than nine. So FDR wanted to add more justices. He wanted to add a retirement age to the court that said that if there's a justice that's over this age, he can stay on the court, but FDR can add a new one to balance him out. Now, when FDR rolled out this scheme, he thought it was going to go over well and it was going to save the New Deal, but Republicans and Democrats said, whoa, hold on there, buddy. Okay, this sounds like court packing. You're just adding a bunch of guys on the court so you can control it. Okay, he would have been able to add like six or seven justices to the Supreme Court in just a few days, and he would have given him way too much power. Many people thought that this was FDR becoming more powerful. What happened was every single thing that the New Deal did was trying to help people, typically, but it also gave the president more power. And so the president today has a lot more power than the presidents did back when the Constitution was written. And a lot of that change happened during the New Deal because all these programs that the Congress creates, who's in charge of them? The president. And every one of those programs gives him more power. So by 1938, most Americans thought the FDR just went too far, and he, they thought that he was trying to make the crisis last longer to further his growth in power. And so conservatives end up regaining control of Congress. And so by 1938, the New Deal loses its steam. FDR is still president, but all the big laws that changed the country, those happened right at the beginning of the New Deal. And was the New Deal effective? Kind of, okay? FDR as a leader boldly and confidently faced one of the greatest crises of American history in a manner that managed to help people while also preserving free market economy and avoiding socialism. So in that regard, it was a success. We got through the crisis, people got help that they needed, but we didn't become communist or fascist. So that's good. He had a really good grasp on the radio. He had a very charming public persona. He got people to love him. He was incredibly popular, but his critics thought that his nice persona masked an abuse of power, and they thought that he was starting an imperial presidency that would endanger the balance of powers between the three branches of government. Overall, the New Deal created millions of jobs, lots of public works projects. There's parks and, and monuments today that we would not have that we enjoy even today. There are roads and bridges and parks that we enjoy today because of the New Deal. The FDIC, which insured bank deposits, is a wonderful program that people love and, and are so thankful for today. Things like Social Security, people love it. It's a really popular program. The Securities and Exchange Commission prevents market abuses in the stock market. That's something that everybody loves. A lot of these laws, people love them. Okay? They're well beloved. They're not going away anytime soon, in my opinion. And the government works to manage the economy and help the unfortunate. But did it end the Great Depression? No. Was it good? Probably. 
But did it end the Great Depression? No. By 1939, unemployment was still 19%. So all that money, all that work brought unemployment from 25% to 19%, which is still bad. The government bureaucracy bloated to 600,000 workers who are getting paid for by American taxes. So you see higher taxes, you see a national debt that doubles, and there's still a large gap between the rich and the poor. So the New Deal overall, it made the United States probably a better place to live in, but it didn't end the Great Depression. What ended the Great Depression was World War II, which I plan to talk about in the next video. So if you watched this video, if you got through it, leave a comment and tell me about it. Tell me, what do you think? Did the New Deal solve the problem of the Great Depression? Do you think it was a good thing or do you think it was a bad thing? Let's have a little discussion in the chat if you can, on the comments. Tell me, was it good or was it bad? And I'll be looking for you, all right? And this, this episode of Mr. Baxley's History Glass was uh, sponsored by Washing Your Hands. Wash your hands. <laughs>